Perry. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Episode 43. And Donna is quasi back to normal. That's right. She might scream at y'all because she has no idea how loud she's being still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, my right ear is completely clogged. And that's the ear that her sound comes out of in her <laughs> headphones. And I said, well, why don't you turn your headphones down? She's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, this is, I don't like it like that. This no, is the way it's comfortable. I have to have it. Well, one, my ears are big. And so Carrie's fits like right over her little tiny ears. My Dumbo ears, <laughs> they press on them weird, so, like, it's comfortable this way. So, if she yells at you, that's why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you noticed on our Sinister Sightings, at one point, I, like, start screaming. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> but I think it's because I couldn't hear myself. Yeah. So, I was like, oh, I'm I'm so low. Yeah. But... I, like, was listening to that episode, and I was like, okay, Donna, like... Stop screaming at everybody. She's talking in caps, people. (laughs) Just starting this off, if y'all have not listened to my podcast that I recommended called Cold, y'all need to go listen. It makes my blood cold. I mean, nope. It makes my blood boil. If you're cold, go listen to it, and you're gonna be fucking pissed. Uh Uh-oh. Like, it's getting even more where I'm just like... Is it, like, one story, or is each episode it's different? It's one story. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And, like, I mean, it's a stupid thing where you're, like, this person did it, but, like, it just walks in the light, you know? Mm-hmm. And you're, like, what? But, okay, so they have these recordings of some of the people, and some of these people sound just like Warren Jeffs to me. Like when he's doing his weird, uh-huh. his weird voice. I can't even do it. Like how he does it, you know, and yeah. you're like, oh, this guy, this guy kills people. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, allegedly, but I'm like, it's a certain voice that people have. Why do you record it? Because one that just right there, I'm like, oh, he's a killer. One more podcast recommendation and then I'm done. It's called Bear Brook, and it's about some bodies are found in barrels, and it's, like, all unsolved, and they have to figure it out. But this is the first case that genealogy was used to identify people. And that person who did it identified the Golden State Killer. Mic drop. Yeah, I was like, whoa. Yeah. What's it called again? Bear Brook. Okay. So now that we're on the other side of the plague. Yep. And for those of you who listened to the Typhoid Mary episode and got sick, looking at you, Michelle, I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) We are so looking forward to starting 2019 off now. Look, the first two weeks, they they were just our warm up. Right. For what is to come in 2019. We have plans for Patreon. So, all you Patreoners slash Creepinati, be on the lookout. You want to know what's up? We got a bolo out for the Patreoners. <laughs> so, if you want to know what we're going to do in the Patreon, edge, <laughs> <laughs> look us up uh, on that. And then we've got ideas in the works for new merch. So new merch, new merch. Be checking out the merch business and just everything. Just stay up to date. Our website, aparanormalchicks.com. Donna's going to go first since she didn't even talk last episode. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Y'all, on the Sinister Sightings, my laugh, like, I laughed by saying, ha-ha, it sounded like, because I'd be like, ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> but it's like, every sound I made, I coughed. You do, you still sound not good, but you yeah. sound, you still sound like there's a frog in your throat, but not like a, like a, <clears throat> you need to do that. Like, just yeah. like a. Your throat's closed from swelling, you know? Yeah. But you do sound a ton better. Oh, I feel so much better, y'all. The flu is no fucking joke, is it? No. All right. Picture it. Actually, in Italy. Okay, Sophia. Hit me with it. Uh Uh-huh. I put LOL, LOL. Oh, my God. (laughs) So, there's an island, and it's in the South Lagoon, by Venice, not Sicily. So, almost Sofia, but not. Gotcha. And it is called Pavilia Island. And it's known as being one of the most haunted locations in the world. With pavilions? 
Dun, dun, dun. Oh, this dun, dun, dun went up. Uh-huh. Okay. In 1421, the first people moved over there, and they were like, please let us seek some shelter, because there was, like, barbaric invaders in the mainland. What year was this? 421. Did you say that? Yes. Sorry. All right. So, it is small in size, so... The island was easily defendable, and it wasn't worth any trouble for them to invade it. So, like, they conquer it, and it's like, woohoo, we conquered a penny-sized island. Yeah. Like, not worth it. And you're going to lose men in the process because it's a fucking island, and it's small. And so they could just be like, ring around the, not ring around the, what's it? Red Rover, Red Rover, you know, like holding hands (laughs) all along the island, and you're not coming over. Yeah. So... For centuries, small community lived there, men, women, children. They said they lived in peace. They avoided laws, taxes of the mainland. So, living it, good. However, dwindled by the 14th century, the island was abandoned. A dun dun dun. In 1348, something happened. And it was the bubonic plague. <gasps> Yes. Da, da, da. <laughs> so this is a story I was going to do last week, but I couldn't really talk. So, like, it tied in with your typhoid Mary. Yeah. And I'd already researched it. So here we go. So when the bubonic plague reached Venice, Pavilia, like all the little islands, they became the quarantine colonies. So, like, Typhoid Mary would have been sent here. Yeah. Just some little statistics. Like, the plague killed one out of three Europeans. Damn. So, any symptom-bearing citizen, they went to Pavilia. Didn't matter if you were royalty. Well, not royal. Like, nobility, serf, or, I guess, servant, whatever. You Mm -hmm. know, like. Yeah. Didn't matter. High class, low class, no class. You're going. Yeah. And I totally wrote this. You go into Pavilia so we don't smell you. And in my head, it rhymed. And when I said it, it didn't. So, yeah. So, this is a time when the doctors wore those long nose masks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very scary. They would stuff the bottom of, like, the beak, Uh you know, with herbs. And it would filter the sickness from the air, they thought. Uh Like, they thought it all kind of went... By smell and stuff. So, they that's why they did that. Mm. To not smell, you know, like, rotting flesh and yeah. everything else. I always wonder, like, what do we do right now that in five centuries people are going to be like, what the fuck? Right? Yes. I know, because, like, we're like, okay. But it totally went with what they thought. Yeah. You know? I hope that it's like, you know, in five centuries they're going to look back at, like, how we treated HIV and AIDS and cancer and be like, what the fuck? How did, right. they, how did they not get that? And then it's all eradicated, you know? Yes, that would be amazing. At times, there were so many people getting shipped over to Pavilia that barges were needed to ship the bodies. Holy shit. Anyone who was, like, had mild symptoms were stripped away from their families Society, you know, like, you're gone to Pavilia. Exiled, like I said, smell you later. Once there, they would spend up to 40 days in quarantine, and they either died, or it's like, oh, your symptoms are okay, you can go back. Or they were fine until they were there and then got it and died. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. How many people were shipped over there that was like, they just had a common cold? Right. And then they get there and they're like, Oh, shit. Oh, well, you're here now. We can't send you back. Yep. And you know people had to be, like, on the, like, shifty side to be like, Uh uh-huh. Oh, I hate Carrie. I got to get her out of here. I saw that she was doing this, and they're like, oh, fuck. Come in Mm -hmm. and ship you off. Also, what sucks, too, is that, like, all you want when you're sick is the people you love to take care of you. Yes. And then to be shipped off to some whatever. Yeah. Some rinky-dink island. Where nobody's probably taking care of them. Right. Besides, like, each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they're sick, too, so. Yep. 
and the doctors who draw the short straw mm-hmm. that has to go over there. So the islands, like Pavilia, they were called Lazarettos. You know, real great translation there for me. Mm-hmm. Whatever you call it, whatever. So that was like 1403. They really started, you know, being the places where they're confined. The people mm-hmm. are confined. And like I said about the 40-day thing, that's where we get the word quarantine from. It's 40 days in Italian that they kind of like merge together. What? Yep. And it's all from this. Mind blown. Right? The plague is gone, but we still use that word. Uh, Quarantine, not plague. We still use the plague word, too. All right. But how we said that, you know, like, life there probably wasn't great. Sometimes it wasn't bad. Like, it wasn't a death sentence, you know. Some people did make it out. Hmm. But they say that it was more like purgatory because it was boring as fuck. Because, I mean, you got people dying to the left of you. Yeah. Dying to the right of you. You're just trying to live your best life, get back to your family. But they said that most of them had their own room. Sometimes they even had their own little apartment. Those are probably more of the nobility peeps, you know. Mm-hmm. Like the people here who can afford, like, assisted living versus the people who could afford, like, a nursing home. Yeah, <laughs> on exactly. Medicaid, you know. Yes. They said that they were fed well, drank together, and could send and receive mail. Outgoing letters, according to a 1381 person, you know, that was there at that time, that they were stabbed, sprinkled with vinegar, and fumigated before leaving the island. I'm like, uh, that's okay. okay. I don't think that would work. No. Like, can someone do a study on that to be like, how many people died who received? Oh, right. You know? (laughs) And that's how anthrax was born. Right. Well, I was just thinking, oh, Jenny sent another letter. Well, now (laughs) John Boy has the (laughs) And then we have a final night, John Boy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. But now let's take a turn for the worst. And people who were too sick to protest about being sick or you know what I mean to be (laughs) like like here will me over there yeah you know like I whatever I'm yours just clean my diaper yeah just don't let me sit my own shit right we good (laughs) people like that people who you know obviously died they would be burned on giant pyres yeah like what mm -hmm, because there were so many people being shipped there and yeah. stuff. Like, if they were, like, so sick but not dead yet. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes sometimes you wouldn't know because they're kind of comatose because of them being so sick. And yeah. it's like, I me mean, last week when I didn't move at all and I was like. Yeah, put a mirror under their nose. Right. Well, they they couldn't because, you know what? They didn't have mirrors? I don't know, but they had that long beak thing. They were like, look, I ain't getting too close. If I can't, let me peck you with your beak. Oh, you didn't wake up? Sorry about you. (laughs) Like, put you on, like, roast you like a pig now. (laughs) Right? (laughs) It's like, well. So, like I said, during the worst outbreaks, the island was quickly overrun with dead and dying. Yeah. They were hastily tossed in to a pile. Yeah. And just when they were full, they would burn it. That is horrible. Yes. And nasty. Yes. A lot of the locations for these big burn pits are unmarked and unknown. So it's said that part of the island that's traditionally used for, like, growing food and stuff is where these bodies were burned. Oh, because it probably enriched the soil. Like, (laughs) Like, you know. Now, skip through to 1630, Black Death is added again. So they come back. Because, like, once that first round of plague was over it was like all right you know like it wasn't you know tens and thousands of people coming to the island well then happened again and so between 1629 and 1631 an estimated of 80,000 people in just seven months was in that island holy shit so they said that 
It earned the reputation for being putrid pits of decomposing, diseased corpses and sickly walking dead. Oh, my God. Like, bless it. And it. No, that stunk. Give me that beak. (laughs) (laughs) So, Povilia is said to have hosted over 160,000 infected souls living out their final days there. So many people died that it's rumored that 50% of the soil consists of human remains. (gasps) Yeah. Shit. Because, I mean, just piles, burn them, burn that down, Mm -hmm. pile them on again. Ugh. After the plague stuff, uh, Napoleon actually used this island because he would use the ghostly legends of all the people who died here where locals wouldn't want to come on. And again, it's easily fortified. Mm-hmm. So no one was going to steal his like guns and all yeah. of that. So he had that here. Well, then wars did happen. So even more people died. You know, I mean, they weren't thrown into mass graves and burned probably. Mm-hmm. But, you know. It has to be really fucking hot to burn a body. Yes. So what? I mean, like, okay. So those... Big old fire pits that they made. Like, how did they get it hot enough to cremate the bodies? Or did they? Did they just, you know what I mean? Like, I wonder how that, I mean, I know that's really, like, gruesome and stuff. But if you think about it, I think when you cremate somebody's body now, it gets to, like, 3,500 degrees. Yeah. I could be making that number up, but I think so. So... How, you know, I just it don't know how It probably just they, burn them. Like, it burn flesh. Yeah, well, and it burnt them crispy, but then probably people walked on them and crushed their bones Oh, and God. Stuff. That's awful. You know, I mean, if it's I like, don't even walk on a grave, much less actually on somebody's body. Right. I know. Well, I mean, I'm sure I walk on gra- graves that I don't know are graves, but, like, if I go yeah. to a cemetery, I walk around right. people's graves. Or if I have to, I'm like, sorry, sorry, I sorry. Know. Sorry about that. Okay, so then in 1777, the Magistrate of Health, they took over the island, and they turned it into a checkpoint. So a boat or a ship heading into Venice needed to have inspections because, you know, don't want the disease Mm -hmm. again. But they found it. Again, no more checkpoint. Going back to quarantine over here. So for... Roughly 10 years until the early 1800s, it was a quarantine spot. The hospital shut down, though. Again, it says the grounds are said to hide the remains of over 100,000 bodies. And overgrown blackberry bushes are now where the humans used to be, they say. Jesus. So, remember in the beginning, some people had their own apartments Mm -hmm. and all that. But in the heyday... They didn't have all that because too many bodies, not enough beds. This is what Rocco Benedetti said. He was a 16th century Venetian chronicler. And he lived in his modern life. If you know what that is, you are our people. You're a 90s baby. Yes. Technically, we're 80s babies, but... But... Yeah. I mean, I don't remember anything from, like, Mm -hmm. you know... You hate the 80s anyway, so you block it out, even if you could remember it. Exactly. So, three or four people had to lay on a bed because there's not a lot of room. Oh, my God. Um, It said that the workers collected the dead, threw them in the graves all day without breaks, like just hi-ho, hi-ho, into the pile you go. Um, (laughs) Dang. (laughs) Were the workers some of the sick people, too, I wonder? or Probably. Damn, that's some handmade tales shit. Right? I mean, probably, you know. Or they probably start out as actual workers, mm-hmm. but then they get sick because... They're touching all the mm-hmm. plaguing us bodies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In 1922, a different kind of hospital came up. A mental asylum. Because... Why not put people who we don't understand their mental illness onto an island where nobody has to deal with them? Exactly. And it's like... Who cares if, you know, there's dead bodies over here and all that shit. And it's just going to trigger their hallucinations. Exactly. Cool. Sounds sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. Fuckers. And apparently it was, like, poorly constructed. And 
so what they said is like, yeah, it's a place of exile, not rehabilitation. Oh, absolutely. Not long after they were there, patients said that they started seeing ghosts and hearing disembodied voices at night. But everyone's like, you're crazy. Mm-hmm. Whatever. And with all mental asylums, there's rumors of a 1930s doctor that performed strange experiments on patients. And because these are people who thought who were thought that they needed to be isolated from society, not well enough to be in there, you know, like mm-hmm. all this shit. So probably had no family. Mm-hmm. Or if they did and they reported what they saw to their family, their family didn't fucking believe them. Exactly. Because they thought it was like a hallucination or a delusion of some sort. Right. They said that the doctor would use hand drills, hammers, chisels to perform lobotomies. Jesus. And the patients who didn't cooperate, they were taken to the bell tower and then punished further. But it didn't go into detail about that. But a few years later, the doctor actually jumped from the bell tower. And people said, like, either he jumped from being like, what the fuck have I been doing? Yeah, right. Or, like, the patients actually went up there and Mm -hmm. was like, bye-bye. Yeah, well, yeah, I totally believe that. Ta-ta for now. And... Oh, fuck you. Yes. So there was a nurse, and she said that what she had heard was that this doctor began to see things and hear voices and be tormented. And so he was, like, driven mad, Mm -hmm. jumped to be like, I can't take this anymore. So he fell to the ground from the bell tower. His body's all twisted, but he's still breathing. But then this, like, kind of misty shape was over him, and it was like he was being choked to death by this mist. And then when he passed, like when he was like, last breath, it went away. It dissipated. What? Okay. So the spirits of all those people who were fucked over by people like him Mm -hmm. from the plague were like, fuck you. And exactly took revenge on him for doing it for the people with mental illness. Yep. Because in the afterlife, they finally have their strength. Mm hmm. There is a rumor about this guy saying that he was actually bricked up within the walls oh, shit. of the hospital or the bell tower, which is now used as a lighthouse, but actually not used. But, yeah. you know, it was converted to a lighthouse. But again, rumors. Mm-hmm. Snopes probably said, nope, but I didn't check. So the asylum closed in 1968 and you really can't tell. Like, 1968? Uh-huh. Shit. So you can't really tell anything. It's just like a dilapidated building. But, and they love to say like, oh, it was a hospital. It wasn't, you know, again, trying to whitewash their Mm -hmm. thing. But there is a sign that actually says psychiatric department and stuff still. It's like chiseled, you know, in the thing. So by mid 20th century, the facility was converted into a geriatric center, which closed in 19... 75 and it basically housed home old homeless people Mm -hmm. you know the people who it's like so basically this island housed every single disenfranchised soul that it possibly could exactly today the entire island is abandoned locals tourists all of people all of the above prohibited from going on there like you can't go Fishermen steer clear, you know, because one, it's rumored to be haunted. Mm -hmm. Two, the fishermen said they didn't want to catch any, like, skeletons or bones or anything in their nets close to there. Yeah. And three, I wonder if, like, the wildlife there carries the plague. Oh. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if they were exposed and they have, even if, like kind of like typhoid mary like a healthy carrier or if you eat that meat or whatever you know well you know they do have actually wine that's made from that blackberry stuff that no no absolutely no 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 first of all no (laughs) second of all nope right like oh i can 
There's a hint of cedar. Oh, no, no, no. That's human ash. Yes, that's decaying flesh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, it literally had a bone in it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that is funny. And, like, I get, like, we use animal shit and all of that. And, like, yeah. I think that, like, legit dead whatever really does help the soil and stuff. I mean, I'm no herbologist. <laughs> Is that a thing? Sure. But there's just something about, even if, I don't know, it, 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 there's something very unsettling about it being yes. from a mass grave. Yes. Even if the people were treated amazingly. Mm-hmm. Like, even if it was, like, the best assisted living here for the richest people ever. Right. You know, and but it was still a mass grave. A mass grave from a deadly disease. That they... Let people pile up Ugh. until it was big enough to burn. Yes. So Ugh. not just like they burned it every day. No, they like left it for a few days. Ugh. It was like okay, well we got well we got about six hundred in there. Let's light this bitch on fire. Are you fucking kidding? That's disgusting. Can you imagine the people who were actually alive? But like, oh my god, I just pictured it. They were the people on Titanic when they're like almost freezing to death, and they're like, come back. You know? Yes. And, like, you have frozen bodies that are just, like, by you, and you're, like, I'm I'm, I'm about to be with them. hmm You know? Like, ugh. That's always a sad part. Anyway. <sighs> this is too much. I know. So, they do have remaining buildings, the hospital, a church, and a shelter for boats. They're all, like, dilapidated, but you can see them. And that mm-hmm. bell tower... That's, like, you know you're there if you see that bell tower. But you said it's a lighthouse now, huh? It doesn't look like a lighthouse. You'll have to see pictures of it. They just said it was changed into that, so it's no longer, like, got a bell. Okay. You know, but it's not, like, a lighthouse with the... Actual spinning light. Yeah. Like, it doesn't look like a lighthouse. So, in 2014... Damn. Yep. Italy was like, hey, you know what? We actually need to pay off some debt. So let's auction this property, and it was for a 99-year lease, and an Italian businessman won the auction, and his name is Luigi Braganero? I don't know. His name's Luigi, though. Is he a plumber? Uh, Does he have a brother (laughs) named Mario? Nope. Mm -mm. But he owns an employment agency. He bought the place for $704,000. That's it? Uh Uh-huh. That's it. And see, they thought they were going to get a lot of money for it, but no one wants this place because, hello, it's supposed to be haunted. But this I'm surprised guy, they didn't get more for it, though, because... But, see, the locals and shit, they're like... Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Bad juju. Exactly. They didn't have a good PR person. Right. Because I'm surprised Zach Bagans didn't buy that shit up. Well... Okay. Well, <laughs> but this guy, Luigi, he wants to make it, like, a luxury resort. Fuck that. And I'm like, okay, uh, have you seen The Shining? <laughs> like... Yeah. Uh, no. No. So, because it's, like, the most haunted place in the world, there are stories about shit, you know, that goes bump in the night. hmm There's a lot of people who say they still hear the moans and cries oh, at night. Oh, God. And coughing. <gasps> like, that is more heartbreaking than anything. And one, it's probably just me right now. I was going to say, <laughs> because you are still coughing. Yes. But, God, I don't want to... If I died right now, I do not want to be coughing in the afterlife. Be like, please. It kind of... This kind of makes me feel really guilty for joking about the plague. I know, right? But we did. Some say there are some violent ghosts in the buildings. They touch or push, hit, and they've even choked some people in there. Yeah, the guy from the bell tower. Right. Uh, He's like, hold on, let me use my chisel over here. (laughs) Oh, Lord. Is that a chisel or are you just happy to see me? And he'd be like, no, that's my hand. So So there was a family that visited the island and they were like, all right, we're going to build... What? <laughs> Just thinking about your hands <laughs> <laughs> It didn't even make sense. No, it didn't. <laughs> I know. Oh, God, that's funny. <laughs> okay. So they're like, mm, because these people are, you know, super wealthy, and they're like, hey, 
This is before he buys the island. This was a little bit before. Okay. They're like, we are going to turn this into the most bitchin' holiday home ever. After the first night, they left. What? Actually, they fr- they left that first night because they said that their daughter's face was tore open and she was bleeding from it and required 14 stitches. But they will not talk about what happened. What? Yeah. And it's like, oh, wait, you want to do holiday here, right? Uh-huh. There was another incident where a man who had went to the island heard a voice asking him to leave, like, leave this place immediately. And he was like, done. Yeah. Done, son. I know how to follow directions. <laughs> and like I mentioned, the screams and moans can be heard, and the local fishermen have stopped fishing there because they find human remains in their nets. And also, they say, like, if you put your net... Like, on the blocks that are around the island or mm-hmm. whatever. Like, you know, just, I'm going to cast my net here. Or I don't know. I don't fish. I don't know. It's bad luck. So, you know, I mean, just superstitious. Yeah. Of just don't, they don't go by it. Because it's like nothing good can come from all that fucking death. People who go searching on the island, because it's off limits and you can't trespass but there's still some fishermen or people with boats that you can pay a lot of fucking money to Mm -hmm. and they'll take you so people who have done that they say like once their foot steps on that island and they're out of the boat so I guess it would be feet who knows they're suddenly overcome with the urge like get back in the boat go don't look back don't collect your two hundred dollars Fucking go. Also, people have heard the bell from the bell tower ringing. And the bell's gone, huh? The bell's gone. (gasps) Yes. Sorry I took your thunder. It's okay. You're used to it now? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I do exactly to you on your story what I hate with that you do during TV and movies. But it's okay. I'm also used to that. (laughs) (laughs) What do you mean, me hating you doing something that I do? Exactly. (laughs) A lot of people see shadowy figures around there. Psychics who have visited have been like, whoa. The energy, it's very, you know, like just a lot of suffering and very angry spirits. And the heaviness is like too much for them Mm -hmm. to take on there. So... They're just like, nope, too traumatic, we out. So it's like, damn, Mm -hmm. the people who could help communicate with them can't even, you know, they're overwhelmed with it. And so here we come to Dibbick Douche, Zach Bagans. This, I believe Tiffany watched it with me. This was my favorite episode ever that they did. And it was in 2009. Damn. Like, season three. And I remember this. Like, this is back when he didn't have a camera crew. It was really the three of them. Mm-hmm. And they did it. I mean, his pants were still super, like, baggy. And he was, like... Still a douche. Yeah. I mean, he was, like, whoa douche right there. Because he was that young douche. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, now he's, like... He, like, has as many seasons as SVU does. Yeah. So, I mean, he could be a douche if he wants to be a douche. I mean, he's a douche, allegedly. But, like, this, I mean, he was a nobody. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're like, bruh. Like, because that's what they all say, you know? Mm-hmm. But it was one of my, seriously, one of my favorite episodes. And it really did scare me because he wears one of those beak masks. And... It is just like... Talk about a triggering object. Fuck. Because you know how he likes to do. And um, then he got possessed. And he did. Well, of course he, he did. did. He did. <laughs> and it was priceless. But seriously, I remember him putting that mask on. I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to sleep after this, you know? Yeah. Because one, that's scary. But two, like in night vision, uh, no thank you. That is, like, a triggering AF uh-huh. object. I mean, like, by the fucker. And he, like, talked to them with it, you know? So mm-hmm. it's just like, oh! Okay. So, you know, they have to get people to take them there anyway. Oh, 
And so he's doing a little boat trip in Venice, you know, because, like, that's the thing to do. And he's like, this is, like, as packed as the highway is in the United States. It's like, well, yes, it's our fucking road, basically. So, yes, that's how it works. Sorry, I just screamed at y'all. But also, he's like, if I was back there, I'd be bumping into everything. Well, yes, because this is their fucking job, and they had to learn the skill. Like... This motherfucker. You know what I mean? I'm just like, it, can you enjoy the ride? And the boat that he was in, sort of, I had, like, purple fur on the side. And I'm like, how did you find that one? Or did you bring that in your carry I was going to say. I mean, anyway. Oh, it, it's a gem of an episode. But, okay, so they're walking around with their guide. And he's, like, talking about what's actually living on the island. And so he's, like, poison ivy. Scorpion and rats. And so Zach's like, big rats? And the guy's like, uh, yeah, probably the biggest you've ever seen. Um, okay. Well, at this point, Zach's like walking behind him and he like jumps at something. And the guide, without missing a beat, is like, that was only a lizard. (laughs) Oh my God. Like, I, I, at that point, I was like, Zach, I totally understand you. Like, I get you on that level. Yes. Like, Oh, absolutely. I, I'm laughing at him, but I don't. I, I wouldn't have done it. Like, I would not have oh, gone. no. He would have been like... Just the thought of, like, the fucking, like, neutral rat size. Yes. Rats there. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No, no, no. I'm not trying to have a fucking armadillo come out at me. <laughs> right. That's really a rat. I mean, ratatouille, you can stay, but everyone else got to go. Mm-mm. You know, they leave. They do their little stuff. Well, and then they are coming back at night. Like, they're about to leave from the little dock. Their boat wouldn't start. <laughs> And, of course it wouldn't. Right. So they had to find another one to use. And he's like, they had wanted to do this for so long. And so this was his, like, Mount Everest. Yeah. You know, and everyone step up. So he's like, let me get out. I'm getting someone. We're going over there. And they're all like, okay. You know, like, super pumped, but super nervous. Yeah. And above them, there was, like, an X in the sky from, like, clouds. It kind of looks like if, like, a jet had flown. Yeah. But still, it was like X, and they were like, oh, God, because it kind of looks like the X's that they put where they're going to put the cameras Mm -hmm. and, like, what they put on the maps and stuff. And it was just kind of like, yeah. and the boat doesn't start, and it's like, you're going to be staying over here by yourself Mm -hmm. for, you know, a whole night. Those are very ominous signs. Yes. When they got there, their equipment started failing, giving weird, like, their batteries would drain, you know. All of a sudden, just a dire sense of dread yeah. just came over them. They all felt so heavy, so just almost defeated, you know. Like, ugh. well, so they did hear disembodied voices. They heard footsteps. And at one point, they're like, use our energy, which, no. But... They're telling that in Italian and all kinds Mm -hmm. of stuff. And then they all start feeling more drained. So Aaron's, like, holding onto the wall. Like, looks like his oxygen has been depleted. You know, I mean, just run down. And they're like, oh, Nick just asked to use our energy, bro. You know? And then, dun-dun-dun, Zach got possessed. He got very fucking angry and he was like shaking a camera he said get it get it from me like oh my god and then he was like punching a wall and they're like dude bro bro he's like i've been overcome you know jesus and he said and like he does like look at the camera and he's like fucking pissed off like you got the last dead hardy shirt you know (laughs) like pissed off and he said that when he looked at Nick, everything was, like, glazed over in red mm-hmm. and was just, like, kill, 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 you know? And so he's, like, I'm going to kill this wall. Then he's fine. <laughs> Quite a long possession. hmm Yeah. Just a commercial break. <laughs> then they go out over this bridge where, like, you know, the bodies were supposed to be. And he, the shit he says to them, you know, he just provokes them, which mm-hmm. I... It's like, ugh. But then he wore that mask and just everything, like, in this field. 
And so he gets them all riled up and he's like, all right, let's leave a camera here. And they do see it's unseen, but seen, like can't see it, but you see the tall grass kind of move. So it'd be like in signs, Mm -hmm. you know, or the uh, cornfield and stuff. Like you could see it move. Yes. It was like that, but it was like a misty thing and it you could hear moaning during that time that it like moved across so fucking freaky and then in one spot they had a camera set up and they had old fucking boombox looking thing radio cd player and they had a cd play in a loop of questions in uh italian and some were answered in italian and stuff so it was just like Dang, you know, it's just cool to, that they even did that and didn't just, like, only do English or mm-hmm. whatever. Like, they really did do that. I want Ghost Brothers to go. Yes, I love Ghost Bros. Pop that trunk. I can pop my trunk. Mm-hmm. That joke never gets old. No, it doesn't. If you've done the watch party with us when we've watched that show, you know that we make it every fucking episode. Yes. Okay, so... Some of the EVPs they got, when he was out in the field, he heard Zach. And, like, you can hear that. They've heard the word no. Different spikes in the EMF stuff. It did say that when Aaron was, like, feeling lightheaded and all that, there was an orb that, like, shoots across his head. You know, like, in the Mm -hmm. picture. Or that motion picture. (laughs) Like, (laughs) who, who am I? I'm a doctor from the plague era. Sorry. And I, like, totally did my arms up, like, boo. Like you were a ghost. Yes. <laughs> I was a ghost ventriloquist kind of thing. I don't know. You looked like on Beetlejuice when they tried to be scared. <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. They all start smelling stuff that smells like it's burning. Ooh. Yes. So, yeah. So, some of the EVPs that they caught on that camera that had the loop going, it was, come here, I'm here, in Italian, Let's fight. Hey, and bye-bye. wonder why let's fight. They probably didn't like his jeans. <laughs> probably. They go to the bell tower, and it is cool that he climbs that ladder that the doctor climbed. Like, it's still there, you know? What? Like, it's just crazy. All that history and, like, yeah. you know? I mean, I wouldn't have climbed it because it's, like... You a know. rickety old ladder. Right. And it's like when uh, that you like, it's not like a, a lean to ladder. It's a not plus size friendly. Exactly. It's like circular, mm-hmm. you know, like, and you're just going up into pure darkness. Cause it is scary when you think about like they turn, he turned off the night vision and he's like, this is what we're seeing. And it's pitch black. And so they have the night vision on and they're looking through their LCD screens. You know, Damn. that is so scary. Okay, so they go up there, and then Aaron hears something fall. Like, it sounds like it's falling from the bell tower. I wonder, like, who do they have to get permission from to go to this island? Like, Italy's government? Or yeah, yeah. the guy that owned it in 2000? Well, this was 2009, this was I guess. This was before, yeah. So, it was the government. Damn. It's crazy. But, and I ended with the possession, but I, you know, premature... Like he Uh, is. I was just about to say. (laughs) So I had to do that. But would you go visit this? Nope. I would ride by it on a boat. I think I would ride by it. And like I would want to be like close to it. You know, and just like kind of like touch it. Maybe like the sides of it where the the blocks are Mm -hmm. literally making the wall of it. But that's it. Well, because I mean. Because again, I don't want to walk on ash because like he like dug his knife into it and it's just like that i mean i hate to say it but it really does look like cremains yeah and i'm not okay with that yeah i mean i feel like what's the point you know other than i don't know because i mean i guess our reasoning is really shitty because every single haunting like this has some sort of trauma and potential death and Mm -hmm. you know well it's just bodies places and all that but it's just like i feel like these people it's not like these are more exposed like they literally were just burned and then like burned into the ground yeah they weren't like oh okay let's 
put stuff on top of it. No, like they just burn them and then like burn the rest of it and then burn some more. And then shit grew up. Yeah. And it's not like, like one victim is worse or better or whatever, but it's like, I just feel so sorry for these people because they were sick and there's yeah. nothing they could do about it. And it wasn't because of any, not to like victim blame about anybody else, but right. like they're just these bless their hearts. They're, they, they're sick with the fucking plague. It's like, yeah. that's not enough. You have to have gone to this island and, ha- you know? Yeah. So that's why I guess it just like, it just breaks my heart more for some reason. Yeah. The Grinch has a heart. Shut up. <laughs> it grew three times or whatever. <laughs> but something did. Damn. My belly over the holidays? <laughs> yes, it did. I ate a lot. All right, your turn. I am doing the female serial killer, Jane Toppin. Toppin the morning to you. She does have a lot of names. Oh, fur. <laughs> and unlike the other stories where I get names confused, I made sure that I really understood the names <laughs> this time. A.K.A. Paula and Gertrude. <laughs> yeah, I'm never going to live that. Not the same person. <laughs> never going to live that down. Okay. She was not born Jane Toppin. She was born Honora Kelly. She was born in 1857. And given the year, we don't know a ton about her childhood. We do know it was pretty shitty. But what we do know is she was born in Boston. But her parents were Irish immigrants. That's funny. Yesterday was, I mean, not yesterday. You know, yesterday when we did that episode. (laughs) Just kidding. Last week. Her mother, Bridget Kelly, though, died of tuberculosis when she was, like, when Jane was really young. Uh, and her dad, Peter, so he was a tailor in the era, ooh, you know, area, you know? Yeah. People called him Kelly the Crack, as in, like, Crackpot. And because, <laughs> okay. like, apparently he was pretty nuts. He was also an alcoholic and pretty abusive. Like, he was just, like, eccentric, you know? And so oh, people called him. Oh, he was, him, like, um... Belle's dad in Beauty and the Beast. Yes. But, I mean, a terrible person also. And and really actually off his rocker. True. He went, supposedly, some stuff made it sound like this for sure happened, but some stuff was like, yeah, it's a rumor. That when, like, not long after his wife died of tuberculosis, he further went insane and sewed his eyelids shut. Oh, no, uh, ooh, uh-huh. no, no. He's a tailor, so I bet it was uh, good. Perfect. Yeah. So, in 1863, he, like, couldn't deal with it anymore. So, he took the two youngest, Jane, who at the time was six, and her eight-year-old sister, Delilah, to the Boston Female Asylum, which was an orphanage for indigent little girls. Oh. So, when he surrendered them over to the... Orphanage, he never, they never saw him again. Oh, gosh. Um, but the, like, again, we don't know much about their their life with him, but what we do know is that the documentation for the asylum said, quote, they were rescued from a very miserable home. Oh, gosh. So you that. know if the records in 1863 right. said it was a bad home? Yeah. Holy shit. There also aren't a whole lot of records of what their life was like at the asylum slash orphanage. Her sister... Did I call her Delilah earlier? Yes. It's Delia. Remember when I said I was going to get the names (laughs) right? Oh, my God. Names are not my strong suit. Okay. You know how that guy... God, I can't think of his name. Imagine that. But he's like, Major Key. DJ Khaled. Major Key. Uh, Major Key. Okay. Okay, apparently you didn't know that, but it's in, like, every fucking song he does. Um, DJ Khaled? Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's like, my, my, my major key. Okay. Because it's, like, his major keys in life to, like, yeah. whatever. That is youth, but it's, like, r- 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 wrong name. <laughs> like, name fuck up. This motherfucker. <laughs> I mean. She ain't wrong. <laughs> it's been, like, I'm surprised Typhoid Mary was actually correct. It was really Typhoid Janice. <laughs> okay. So now that we've come first, you. Her sister, Delia, actually ended up becoming, like, she never got adopted out. So she actually became a sex worker. Oh, gosh. And then they had an older sister, Nellie. 
so she wasn't she was too old like she was able to take care of herself when her when their dad took them to the orphanage and so she didn't actually go but later she had some mental instability and she was committed to what we would call like an insane asylum mm. later so in November of 1964, it was less than two years after their dad had left them there, Jane was placed as an indentured servant at the home of Miss Anne C. Toppin of Lowell, Massachusetts. So this girl's like eight years old. Oh, God! And goes to this house as an indentured servant to like yeah. work off whatever. Can you imagine? Eight, like, no. I can't even get my eight-year-old nephews to, like, or my nephews when they were eight, to do shit, much less be, like, a fucking indentured servant. And for her to have to know, like, I have to do this Uh because to work off whatever. But what I don't understand, though, is, like, indentured servants usually were paying for, like, their passage to, like, let's say America from, like, from Ireland. So, like, why was she an indentured servant to them? I don't know. Like, why was that what she was? You know what I mean? Yeah. What was she paying off? I don't know. Maybe she was paying off their, like, adopting her, basically. But that's not how this works. You know what I mean? No, I know. I'm just trying to think, like... But the thing is, they never actually formally adopted her. She just took their name. Mm. So, she was purely their indentured servant. So, she... Was their indentured servant. They never actually adopted her. She had a sister by the name of Elizabeth, like the the Toppins. Mm -hmm. It was their biological daughter. And they told, the Toppins told people that she was Italian instead of Irish because there was a really big stigma Mm -hmm. among, like, with Irish immigrants So they just told everybody she was Italian and that her parents had died at sea. And that's Mm -hmm. why they adopted her, even though they didn't actually adopt her. Right. There were two articles that I read that kind of had contradicting stuff about her time, like in school. One article said that she did really well in school. She had lots of friends, but that she got, quote, unattractively fat. Uh, okay. So, fuck y'all. Right? Uh, we're attractively fat, so... Okay. So, uh, speak for yourself, stupid article. That's why she changed her name to Jane to sound less Gaelic sounding. Okay. Even though Jane was Irish, she had that recessive gene that made her dark hair, you know, that olive skin. Mm -hmm. And so she was, it was easy to pass her off as Italian. She grew up with Elizabeth as her sister, but I think that was just kind of like, for the public appearance mm-hmm. at home, they never let her forget, like, kind of where she fell in that pecking order. She legit was Cinderella. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cinder fucking Rella. <laughs> what movie? Um, thing. Pretty Woman. Yep. Okay. It said that she and Elizabeth actually got along, but that overall, like, when she went to school, she wasn't very popular. She would kind of just have, like, these wild fantasies that she would lie about and stuff because they, they say that she was, it was like she was like overcompensating because because she was she unattractively was, fat. Yeah, well. Oh my God. Same article, fucker. It's not. Um, oh, okay, sorry, bye. Because, you know, she's this Irish American born to immigrants who at the time it was, well, hell, probably now still too, but, you know, they were just treated differently. And so, then she gets, like, fake adopted by these other people. She didn't, she never was fully adopted. She's their indentured servant. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. Did you ever watch Cry Baby? No. God, I really thought you were going to say, of course. Because, who the fuck are you? I mean, I've seen pieces of it, but never the whole thing. Well, that just popped into my head when Cry Baby's sister, Ricky Lake, she had to put her kids up for adoption Uh in, like, this basically shopping mall and they're in the <laughs> they're in the big window and like one's like ironing clothes or yeah. whatever and it was just so random and then these people are going like shopping 
Yeah. Basically window shopping kids. Yeah. But it just reminded me of that. I'm so sorry. But I was like, oh my God, it's Crybaby. Sorry. And now back to the scheduled podcast at hand. So she's, you know, this indentured servant having to lie about who she is as far as her, where she's, you know, where her family's from and all of this. And then she was never actually adopted. So she, you know, she's got these, I mean, she's a child. Mm -hmm. She's trying to cope with her surroundings and probably how poorly she feels about herself, you know? So anyway, so she has these like wild fantasies where she makes stuff up and they say that it's her compensating for her lack of actual knowledge, but she just didn't have a good relationship with kids her age. Like she would tattletale on them to the teacher Mm. um, and then she would do things bad and then blame it on the other kids. She was like super gossipy about, but like really bad Mm -hmm. stuff, you know? So she never really made much, many friends. When Jane was 18, she graduated from Lowell High School. She was freed from her, like, indentured service status. She was given $50, but she decided to stay on the house as a servant. Well, when her adopted mother, Anne, passed, Elizabeth was take like, took over the household as the, you know, headmistress, I guess you'd say. And Elizabeth ended up marrying um, a man named Ormel Brigham. And there was some, like, some sort of, like, not altercation, but just, like, disagree. I don't know. But anyway, it made Jane go, okay, I I gotta get out of this house. I can't live here anymore. What can I go do that's, like, gonna make me money that's not this, like, menial type work that only, that women have, you know, at the time. So when she was 33, she decided to go do training as a nurse. This was in 1887. So she went to Cambridge Hospital. That's where she, they called her Jolly Jane because she was like really outgoing. Like she had learned from her past as a kid where, you know, she didn't have good relationships with people. And so she was able to kind of make adjustments a little bit. And so... She still, like, was really gossipy. And, like, when the the students that she didn't like, like, got, like, kicked out and stuff, she would <laughs> got excited about it. But uh-huh. she was still, she was better than she was a kid. She was learning. Yeah. Growing. Slash a psychopath learning to read. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And she was, she was still a liar. Like, she said that the Tsar of Russia... Like, had offered her a nursing job that she turned down. Oh, and Lord. That, But then, like, she also was, like, a petty thief. Like, she would just steal little things from people. Apparently, she had an obsession with autopsies. And the hospital was like, hmm. Something's okay. In 1887, there was a patient named Amelia Finney. And she had an operation, and she said that she that Jane had Jane Toppin had given her some medicine that caused her to kind of lose some consciousness, and she was she thought she remembered Jane climbing into bed with her and like kissing her all over her face. Oh, uh, what? And then like something startled Jane, and she got out of bed. But the next morning, when Amelia woke up, she was like. No, I guess, I guess that was all a dream. I guess I was, like, right. hallucinating from, like, that morphine or whatever. Right. So when she was at the Cambridge Hospital, that was, like, basically nursing school for the 1800s. When she finished that training, she had, that's when she got a job at Massachusetts General Hospital. And she was doing a great job on the fast track to promotion. But at Mass General, it was more... I guess, serious of a position. Like, they were more aware of paperwork and all that stuff. So, Uh. and they actually knew what people were doing with patients and that sort of thing. And she ended up, like, getting a reputation for taking credit for other people's work. No. She was, because, like, what she would do is she would give people medicine, and then she would, like, tamper with the records so that it wouldn't look like she did something wrong. And then she was really, like, she was conniving in that she would, like, point out other people's incompetencies. Is that a word? When really it's her. 
Wow. So she, in 1990 is when her time at Mass General ended. She was popular with the doctors, but not so much with the other nurses. Again, she was suspected of a lot of, like, little petty stealing, you know, crimes. Like, even one of, like, just small amounts of cash, but also one of the patient's diamond rings. Fuck you. But one time, she left the nursing ward without permission, and that's why she was dismissed from her job. And so, because of that, even though she had passed the final exam, she did not like she qualified for her diploma, she didn't get her license to practice a nurse because she had left the ward right. without permission. Damn. I know. So even though when she was at Mass General, she like was basically fired because she left her command post, the physician still recommended her to work as a private nurse instead of just... You know, because she couldn't work at that hospital anymore. As a private nurse, Jane, she was making $25 a week. And most women at the time were making $5 a week. So she was like rolling in the fucking dough. So about this time, she makes friends with her landlord. It's an elderly man and his wife. Some stuff says that, like, they call her an angel of death. But she's not an angel of death in that she thought that people were suffering and so she killed them so that they wouldn't suffer anymore. She was just an asshole. Her colleagues at nursing school remember her just saying that, like, there was no use in keeping old people alive. So she ended up killing this, her landlord and his wife. She just later said, well, they were feeble and fussy. And just old and cranky. So she just fucking killed him. So she's like, I mean, I'm doing a favor. I mean, they're a burden. Fuck you. Fuck. Probably because she felt like a burden on her, Mm -hmm. I would say, step family. You know, so she's like, everyone's a burden. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so she probably, well, I don't know. I don't know. I was about to humanize her more where I was like. Well, maybe she didn't want them to not have anyone Mm-mm. and be a burden, but no, she's no, yeah, she was putting this on them and absolutely seeking her revenge and getting that frustration out by killing other people who didn't ask to be killed. Mm-hmm. In 1889, there was a 70-year-old named Mary McLear, and when she was at the Cambridge Hospital, she was really sick, and the doctor was like. I'm going to send in one of my best nurses. Oh, gosh. Of course, it was Jane. And Jane poisoned her. She's like, hello. Then. (laughs) Goodbye. Listen to this bullshit. Okay, so Jane had a friend who worked in the dining, as a dining hall matron at St. John's Theological School in Cambridge. And Jane wanted that job. What'd she do? Poisoned her friend with strychnine. Fuck. So she gets a job, but it was kind of like a promotion job. And so administration was like, um, we're getting lots of complaints that she is an idiot and doesn't know how to do this job. <laughs> and there's money missing. So uh, you fired. Oh, fuck. So then she's like, okay. Well, I killed my friend already. No, she's like, fuck. I had to go through all that effort, wasted good fucking strychnine mm-hmm. to get this damn job. So then she's like, okay. Hmm, what can I do next? In 1899, she's vacationing at Buzzards Bay. Does not sound like a pleasant place. Sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) When her sister, Elizabeth, says, Hey, you know what? Like, I'm down here at the Cape. Kind of lonely. Why don't you come down? And so, Jane was like, all right. I mean, I'm at Buzzards Bay, so the Cape sounds amazing. Sounds amazing swimmingly (laughs) so she's like okay 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 i'll come well not long after she got there elizabeth's husband ormel ormel (laughs) as in the chili that just fucked your stomach up he got a telegraph saying that elizabeth was really sick so he's like okay i'm gonna like i'm coming you know so yeah but by the time he got there elizabeth was in the coma 
And the doctors told him it was because of a stroke. Gosh. Elizabeth never regained consciousness. No. And she ended up dying the next morning. The day that she had supposedly had the stroke, she and Jane went out for a picnic for with cold corned beef sandwiches, mm. taffy, and mineral water laced with strychnine. But that taffy, though. I mean, did it have the jokes <laughs> on the package? Was it salt water? If it did not have the jokes on this package, I don't want it. I'll eat yours. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you'd have some really good muscles if you did that job. Mm-hmm. Pulling that. Meanwhile, y'all went to Tennessee and you didn't bring back any taffy. I didn't eat any taffy while I was there. But was I supposed to? I thought like Gallenberg was like taffy capital of the world. Not really. Isn't that like Long Island, Rhode Island, New Island? I don't mm. know. But I, I don't know. I don't know from that. I want taffy now. I know. Go get me a laffy one. <laughs> When Elizabeth died, Jane was like, okay, I'm going to go back to the house with old Ormel. Mm-hmm. And cause she, she did all of this because she wanted to marry him. Oh, Lord. And so she was like, okay, I'm going to go back to the house with him, and I'm going to make him fall in love with me. Did it work? After she, like, she got back like, to her sister's house, there was like, a housekeeper there. Her name was Edna Bannister. She was 77 years old. Oh, gosh. First of all, how the fuck did she live so long? It was like 1899. Right. Wasn't the life expectancy like 32? Right. And you know this lady's had a hard fucking life. Uh Uh-huh. So what she did was she killed Edna because she wanted to impress Ormel with her housekeeping abilities. Oh, fuck. So he's like, look, I don't want you as a housekeeper or a wife. And so she's like... Okay, I'm going to win his love by poisoning him and nursing him back to health. Oh, God, we've seen this before. It doesn't work. Yeah. So, that didn't work. Of course. So, she was like, he got me pregnant. Oh, fuck. <laughs> and he's like, um, no the fuck I didn't. Get the fuck up out my house. Wait, is this crybaby? Because maybe that's that what it was based on. That also happened again, yes. Maybe that's what it's based on. So, then she was like, okay, okay. I'm going to try, air quotes, and commit suicide with morphine and see if that will work. Man, she has a lot of fucking vision boards, I'm feeling like. (laughs) Well, that didn't work either. So, she was released and she decided to go back to the holiday cottagey thing place where she married married her sister. No, midded her sister. That cottage belonged to a guy named Alden Davis and his wife, Maddie. It was a place that Jane had rented out, like, since 1896. Dang. So she had, you know, it had been, you know, three or four years. She'd, like, her for her holidays and uh-huh. stuff, you know. Well, you know, they had been giving her a good rate all that time, but... After, like, when her sister died, they were like, oh, God, well, we feel really bad asking her for the rent this year. So, you know, they kind of let her slide on the year that, you know, her sister died right. there. But even, they didn't know that she had killed her. Mm-hmm. So the next year, she ended up asking them for an extension on the rent because she didn't have enough. Okay. But when she came back, she still wasn't, like, paying. So Maddie was like, I'm going to go to Boston and I'm going to confront her. Right. So if you remember, she had already killed her previous landlords. Mm-hmm. So when Maddie got there, Jane gave her a glass of water, and it was laced with morphine. Mm. And then Maddie quote took over poorly. So the landlords that she where she was living in Boston were like, okay, well she can rest in this empty room that we have. Right. Well, now. Jane has easy access to her. So she can go up there and inject her with morphine all she fucking wants to. And so she does. She sends her into a coma. Oh, my god! When the doctor gets there, because Jane knew that Maddie was a diabetic, mm. she told the doctor that Jane had eaten a piece of cake when she got there. So the doctor was like, oh, well, 
you know, had no he there was no reason for that doctor su- to suspect anything was going on. Right. And so he just left her there in Jane's care because she's a nurse. Like, there's mm-hmm. no reason, you know, they, they're thinking she's like in a diabetic coma. And so, so Jane's taking care of her in the house for like a week. And she would give her varying dose doses of morphine. Mm. So sometimes Maddie would gain, would like have moments of where she was lucid and yeah. she could speak to to people. But then eventually Jane was like, mm, okay, I'm bored with this. Because wow. she would like, you know, again, give her medicine to bring her out, put her back under, bring her out, put her back under. And she's like, okay, yeah. I'm bored with this. Here's a lethal dose. Oh, fuck. She is merciless, merciless. So when she, so when Maddie died, her two kids, Genevieve and Minnie, decided that because their father was still alive, they were like, okay, we're going to go stay with dad. But at the funeral, they were like, hey, Jane, why don't you come home with us and stay with us for a little while? Oh, fuck. Just sealed her deal in. Mm-hmm. So what does one do when they just killed the matriarch and they have some free time on their hands at the house. Kill, 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 kill. Close. Poison, 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 poison. Close. Fire, fire, fire. Oh, fuck. fuck she fuck. started setting random fires around the house. And then Damn. she would say that, like, she had seen this stranger skulking around. Oh, my gosh. And that they, she was like, that's who's been, like, setting fires everywhere. Because she just liked fucking toying with people. Like, she liked giving medicine, withholding medicine, making, you know, drug interactions, just to see how it fucked with people. And same thing with the fires. It's like, she just wants to fuck with people's lives. Yeah. So, old Jane's urges were just too much. The fire wasn't cutting it. So, Genevieve was really upset about her mother's death. And so, Jane was like... Hmm. Here's my chance. Uh huh. Opportunistic she, at its best and worst. Yes. So she she lied and told Minnie that she had seen Genevieve inspecting a tin of arsenic. And so I know. So the two women together, you know, the sister and Jane, decided they were going to watch Genevieve just to make sure, like, she didn't hurt herself. Well, Jane poisons her with the arsenic, so it looks like she committed suicide. Yeah, wow. So, you know, through Jane's career with the poisonings, she she usually steered clear of those, like, metallic poisonings because you could detect those. Like, you know, when you, what is it, whenever you do arsenic, it, it smells like almonds and stuff mm-hmm. like that on the, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So, with this, with Genevieve's death, it was like she found a new, I don't know if outlet's the right word, because it gave plausible deniability in that she had, like, planted the seeds that she was going to kill herself. You know, she planted those seeds mm-hmm. with the family. And then, because there was such a stigma around suicide, they didn't do a whole lot of investigating in it because they didn't want to cause attention to it, hurt the family, that sort of thing. And so... It was, the matter was handled very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so her cause of death was given as heart disease. Two weeks later, the dad passed away because Jane had given him a lethal dose of morphine. Oh, my God. But they said that it was because of grief because now he'd lost his wife and his daughter. Wow. Well, once you've killed three of the four, I mean... You just got to go with the fourth. Exactly. I mean, you got to be even about it. Exactly. So she had to, quote, complete the set. So four days after the dad died, she killed Minnie. The first time she tried to give her a dose of morphine, Minnie wasn't able to swallow it. So what she did was she gave her the morphine in an enema. Well, that's a shitty job. <laughs> The doctors were like, what the fuck happened here? Like, how'd she die? I guess she just died of exhaustion. Oh, my God. Because her sister, then her dad, then yeah. her. And so it's like, okay, well, the wow. common thread is the person's still alive. Right. Someone's still kicking. 
So the death was like, holy shit, because it was like this whole family. Yeah. Um, And so a paper, like, got, you know, well, a couple of the newspapers kind of got wind of it and were like, oh, my gosh, this unfortunate Davis family. But still no one suspected foul play. Oh, my gosh. Well, and she got nothing for doing all of this. Like, her vision boards sucked because, like, her job that she wanted, Mm -hmm. she got fired from because she was terrible at it. Mm -hmm. You know, she's like, bye-bye, sister. I want, you know, my brother-in-law to be my husband now. And he's like, so long. Psycho. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was one person that was skeptical, I guess I should say. And that was Minnie's father-in-law. His name was Captain Paul Gibbs. And, he, you know, he's he's looking at this and he's like, something's fishy. Right. And so a doctor named Ira Cushing, who was on holiday in the area, and he had seen the dad all, you know, before. Mm-hmm. He was like, okay, there's got to be something going on, too. So they got together and they decided, like, all right, something needs to be done. And so they were like, there's only one man that will do it. Oh, God. Dun, dun, dun. The governor of Cuba. What? Right? So, Leonard Wood was the U.S. military governor of Cuba at the time. Okay. Isn't that crazy? Okay, yeah. Like, that just jumped the shark. (laughs) Because it was like 1901. Oh, my gosh. Anyway. So, he had studied medicine. He had done some, his time in the military as a surgeon. Like, he was badass. Like, he, at the time... He and Teddy Roosevelt formed the Damn. Rough Riders Fuck. to fight the Spanish-American War. And, like, it said that although Teddy Roosevelt got all the glory, it was actually this Leonard Wood who was the commanding officer. Really? Yeah, and then that's why he became a general, and the post is the governor in Cuba. So, wow. it was the summer of 1901 that he was on holiday in Cape Cod when Captain Paul Gibbs came. And was like, look, I need help. So they launched this whole investigation. Okay, so at this time, this is, again, I, I'd already talked about this part, about how she, like, fake tried to kill herself to get her brother-in-law to fall in love with her. So she gets admitted to the hospital. But there's they're already watching her as part of this investigation because... These men, this general and all this doctor, like, they're not dumb. They're like, okay, well, she's the common denominator, so let's start watching her. Mm -hmm. Well, that's when she kind of fakes a suicide with morphine and ends up in the hospital. And so the detective who was following her is like, shit, how am I going to watch her in the hospital? Right. So he faked an illness to get admitted to the hospital, too. When she got discharged from her fake suicide attempt, she went to New Hampshire to visit her friend Sarah Nichols. So, lucky for Sarah, they had exhumed the body of Minnie Gibbs and found evidence of poison. And so, a few weeks after Jane had gotten to her house, the police come to arrest her. And so, they're saying, like, basically, Sarah's very lucky because she probably would have been next because... Jane liked to murder people she knew. Yeah. I mean, it just has a thrill to it, you know? Yes, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, she was arrested for the murder of Minnie Gibbs. That's when they kind of realized, like, holy shit, this is just the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg. There's all these people. There was some stuff in the, like, the trial and stuff. It was a little bit harder for them to prove that she was guilty than they originally thought, but... They were talking about, like, what she used to kill the people, and they had a pharmacologist that said, when he was, like, on the stand, that she used morphine and atrophine because she knew that the most common symptoms of the two poisons, like, would cancel each other out. Like, the contracting wow. and the expanding of the pupils, which were their, the telltale signs of one was contracting, one was expanding, They'd cancel each other out, and so it would be harder to find. And then he was like, look, she also owned the Davis family money, and Alden had $500 when he died, and then it was missing. And so they just were, you know, trying to lay out the motive and stuff to show, like, no, he's, you know, she's really got the motive to do this, blah, 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 blah. Well, 
what they ended up doing was basically they said not not guilty by reason of insanity, mm-hmm. even though she was like, I'm not insane. I knew exactly what I was doing. She, during her interrogation, she admitted to 31 murders. Oh, my God. But they're saying that the number could be as high as 100. Well, that's a 70-something. Actually, it's 69. Yes. Oh, look at that. Math. So here's the thing, though, that she killed a lot of patients. And what she would do, because she was, what made her special, I'm doing air quotes, was that she was one of very few women serial killers that killed for sexual pleasure. She, really? Yeah. She got pleasure of watching them almost die, bring them, bringing them back. Watching them almost die, bringing them back. Watching them almost die, laying in their bed, stroking their face, kissing. So remember that patient at the very uh-huh. beginning that really did happen? Wow. Because she would she would get sexual satis- satisfaction is what I almost said. Well, that too. I mean, look, it's really fancy around here. <laughs> but she got her, it was like thrilling for her versus a typical female serial killer. Yeah. That, like, that's just not not typical, even mm-hmm. now. And so she was, it was a pretty big deal that that was the reason that she did it. So she ended up getting committed to Totten State Hospital, where she died in 1938 at the age of 81. Holy fuck. Isn't that crazy? And they say, like, by the end, she was just another inmate. Well, she, like, sucked their souls out while she lavished their face and all that shit. I was going to say, it was like the freaking Tree of Life or some shit. Right? Poor unfortunate soul. Right. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I know. Isn't that crazy? So, she was, again, a very unusual serial killer for the time, but I feel like even for our time, too, in that it was almost like... I don't know if this is correct, but almost like she's a sexual sadist, you know? Yeah, yeah. In that, you know. she's like a cat and, and mouse for real, though. Like how cats will play with the mice, mm-hmm. and then it's like, oh, they're gonna die, and then we'll leave them, and then get you back. Yeah, you know, wow, crazy. So I don't like some again. Some stuff calls her an angel of death, but she ain't an angel of death. No, mm-mm. she's just a serial killer. Yep. Okay, so what we learn. Well, both of our shit had to do with medical stuff. I know, again. You know, okay, here's what you learn. If someone says, hey, this place is really haunted and all the locals won't go there and stuff, maybe you shouldn't go either. Mm -hmm. Or you might be possessed like Dibbic Douche. Well, he does get possessed everywhere they go. I mean, he's just open to it. He's open to something. That's why he wears the rhinestones and he's bedazzled so much. So, like, he wants them to be able to see him and Mm. be like, live body. We got a warm one here, folks. Meanwhile, all those orbs we see are actually the reflections off his bedazzled shit. Damn. Mystery solved. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like number two that we also learned carries over from last week and it's still wash your fucking hands. (laughs) Oh, my God. For real. (laughs) You're going to eat? Wash your hands. You're going to cook? Wash your hands. If you got to give someone an enema to kill them? Wash your hands. Okay. Especially after, because then you'll get the fucking typhoid. Ugh, for real. Don't get that peach ice cream. Mm Mm-mm. Okay. Three is vision boards work. And... You know what my vision board says right now? Sleep and money. I envision all of these people listening... Are going to rate and review us on iTunes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I like that vision board. I can get behind it. Oh, that, that is was great. good. Thanks. Thanks. That was a good one. Thanks. I think it's going to happen. I hope so. Oh, you know what else? What? Remember, creep it real and, and don't, don't get scared. scared.